Good morning, buenos dias, good morning everyone, and welcome to Ideas Boston and UMass Boston as well. My name is Alberto Vasallo. I, um, I have a couple different roles uh, in the community. One is for many years since I was 13, and I'm not gonna tell you how old, so I mean, I won't say how many years, so you won't do the math. Um, <clears throat> but since I was 13, I've been involved with El Mundo Boston, a uh, Spanish language media outlet uh, that my family started 42 years ago. And 20 years ago, I started also working at Channel 7 as producer and host. I do Urban Update uh, with Byron Barnett. And then I also work with the Boston Red Sox. So I'm a big sports fan, and you'll see how I kind of incorporate it a little in today's, show, in today's program. Um, but to be honest with you, when I was reading the bios of, of our speakers in science, all I could think of was the Big Bang Theory and what you guys do <laughs> when you guys leave here, um, because they're very, very impressive in terms of uh, their fields. Um, as you know, today, uh, this is called Ideas UMass Boston. And uh, as, we would like to, as we like to call it, uh, the event that brings you provocative and inspiring talks by some of the region's leading thinkers. This is a very, very unique event where some of the region's leading thinkers from every imaginable sector push boundaries and share their latest big ideas to create fertile ground for innovation. This is an annual conference uh, where these big ideas are presented in a very fast-paced format that combines succinct and lively presentations artistic breaks, and time for networking and discussion, which we'll have a little bit later. The idea is to provide the ingredients for additional innovation and creative breakthroughs. This was started uh, in 2004 by the Boston Globe, but now it has its home here at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, the region's only public research university. So having said that, uh, our chancellor, Keith Motley, could not be here, but you know how they do this in the Academy Awards, we have a video from him. So we have a message. So he's here not only in spirit, and if you see, ever see him, he's a big guy, he's everywhere, but he's up on the screen today. So let's hit the video. Good morning. Thank you for joining us at Ideas UMass Boston. Welcome to our beautiful waterfront campus overlooking both Dorchester Bay and the Boston skyline. I'm deeply sorry I could not be there in person to take part in what is one of my favorite events all year long. But I know you're in great hands with our fantastic planning team at the helm. I hope you find the Capital City's Urban Public Research University to be the perfect setting to discuss some of the pressing challenges of our day and to hatch some new ideas for their solutions. It is a true accomplishment that we are celebrating the 11th year of Ideas UMass Boston today, continuing a tradition that was first launched by the Boston Globe in 2004. For more than a decade, this conference has attracted some of the brightest minds in the region to exchange ideas about innovation in the realms of technology, economics, public health, sustainability, public policy, and much, 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 much more. You have an impressive lineup of speakers ahead of you, including a few individuals from our own university community. William Bra, founder and executive director of our Venture Development Center. Alumnus Parfait Kassana, now our assistant director of the Center for Peace, Democracy and Development at our McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies and co-founder of the Kajali Reading Center in Rwanda. And Mohi Kansal, who is a global entrepreneur in residence at our Venture Development Center. Whether your background is in engineering, anthropology, or entrepreneurship, there are experts here from a cross section of industries who will give you much to think about today. I'm confident you will find their stories entertaining and insightful. I extend my heartfelt thanks to all of our speakers and panelists who've taken time out of their busy schedules to share their ideas and to contemplate 
the concepts that will shape our present and our future. I invite you to use ideas you mass to broaden your horizons and to interact with those leaders whose thoughts and actions spark your own interest. Perhaps this conference will help light the next fire for positive change in our city, region, or world. There are no limits for the good we can do when we put our heads together. I'd also like to thank our important, important partners in this effort, Boston Business Journal and Mass Inc as well as Plymouth Rock Assurance, the Boston Foundation, Flagship, Flyship Capital Partners, and Brew Boston for all of their support. We could not host this conference without you. At the University of Massachusetts Boston, we are proud of the special commitment to urban and global engagement. Thank you all for helping us to fulfill our mission today. I wish you a thought-provoking and productive conference and hope to see you at the University of Massachusetts Boston again real soon. All right, that was our chancellor. And as you notice, when I have him as a guest on Channel 7, I have to interview him. I only ask him one question, and then he goes on for the rest of the segment. So he's really good <laughs> at this. He mentioned someone who we're actually going to kick, um, kick today off. This particular session, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we will have three presenters. Uh, let me give you a little bit of the format so you know what's going on. My job is really to introduce them. They will each have 15 minutes. They have some slides and presentations. After that, there'll be a, an opportunity for me to do some, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the gist of this session. Now, after this, there'll be a second session with the exact same format with three other speakers. Then we'll have a, a lunch break, and then we've got some afternoon activities. So just to kind of give you some, um, some uh, a, a little perspective, and we encourage you to tweet, uh, use hashtag for this, use social media, get the word out about this uh, event that's going on now. So having said that, our next speaker, Parfai Gasano. He is the co-founder of the Kijali Reading Center. He traces his interest in U.S. foreign policy to his experiences growing up in Rwanda, East Africa, where he observed firsthand the impact of Western policies in shaping regional politics. And he's now the assistant director of the Center for Peace, Democracy, and Development right here at UMass Boston, as the chancellor spoke, at the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. Gasana is also board president of the Kijali Reading Center. Now, while completing his studies in international relations at the McCormick School, he co-founded this nonprofit to bring to children the joy of reading. For his work with the Reading Center, he received UMass Boston's Beacon Graduate Leadership Award and the Ambassador John W. McDonald Award for Leadership and Innovation in Global Governance and Conflict Resolution. And if that wasn't it, I always have one question for the panelists, one interesting question. Who was your favorite all-time athlete? He said it was Ronaldo, the Brazilian soccer legend, the first one, the old one. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Parfait Gasano. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all so much for your kindness and attention. Uh, I'm not going to introduce myself since um, uh, the Chancellor already actually surprised me by introducing us. Uh, but I'm going to just launch right through uh, uh, my presentation for you today. Uh, first, I'm very honored and truly humbled to be here and to have been invited to be one of the speakers in this year's edition of Ideas Boston. At a time when parents and students are wondering whether the choice of a college education is the right one, this due to the rising costs of education and the often elusive promise of employment after college. I'm reminded every day, and especially today, of how incredibly lucky that I am to have come here to UMass Boston. Here at UMass, I have learned a great deal, not only just about how to analyze and interpret world events by fitting them into a pattern that makes sense, but I've also come to grow and mature to become the person that I am today. I know too well that this could not have been possible if not for the unique focus that the University of Massachusetts 
places on each and every student who enters into this campus. This focus stays with us from the moment we enter into campus to the time when we leave with our degrees. And it stays with us even beyond after we've become professionals and leaders in the various fields that we pursue. I'm also convinced that my presence here today could not have been possible without the spirit of, the spirit of innovation that UMass Boston instills in its students. And this spirit, it says that you cannot complain about world injustices if you do very little to play your part to finding the solutions in the communities and in the world. For this, I want to thank our university officials and the faculty and the staff for making my time here at UMass all about how I could be educated and transformed to become a positive contributing member of my community, of the world, and the society. I'm not just a mere bystander who looks on as events happen around me. Today, I'm going to talk to you all about the Kigali Reading Center, which is an English literacy NGO that I co-founded in Rwanda with my classmate last year. This NGO is up and running in my home country, Rwanda. And although we started with only eight children last year, today I am proud to announce to you all that we provide meaningful literacy programs to over 100 children every week. And we have plans to open our second reading room right before the end of the year in one of the areas that were hard hit during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. To date, we have distributed more than 3,000 books to children and their families in the city of Kigali. And we are committed to doing this work because we know that we're not just doing this as ourselves, but we have the community here in Massachusetts behind us to continue to help us to spread the joy of reading in Rwanda. And now, for you to understand the impact of the work that we are doing in Rwanda, one needs not go further than this room. Because I was one of the people who benefited greatly from a program that used children books to teach me English. Ten years ago when I moved here to the United States, I could not put two sentences together in English. And I was introduced to the founder of a group called New Heaven Reads. And this, this group provided free books and tutoring with a few visits every week and books with words and pictures helping me learn. I began on a path that brought me here to UMass Boston. At the Kigali Reading Center, really well that we do is to make sure that we can provide this joy of reading and share the opportunities that were afforded to me when I moved here to the United States. But before I tell you more about the Kigali Reading Center, let me just tell you a little bit about a contrast between the Rwanda where the Kigali Reading Center is operating today and the Rwanda that I discovered in 1994 when I moved there from Burundi. You see, I was born in exile, and for 11 years I lived as a refugee where I heard my parents speak about Rwanda in a romanticized way. They talked about Rwanda's beauty, as you can see, its mountains, the valleys and streams. And I often heard them talk about Rwanda, saying that there was no country on earth as beautiful as Rwanda. My parents even used Rwanda's nickname, nickname to talk about the beauty of Rwanda, which is a country of a thousand hills. In 1994, as the situation in Burundi was beginning to get worse, political strife and civil and ethnic violence were beginning to flare up, we began to receive daily threats that we would be killed if we did not leave Burundi and go to Rwanda. My father took these threats very seriously and decided the time had come for us to go to Rwanda. And in, in his reasoning, he thought that if we were to be killed in Rwanda, this would have been a much, much better fate for us, dying in our own country, giving us a chance as children to see it for the first time, rather than dying in exile. To my shocking surprise when I moved to Rwanda, instead of the beautiful mountains and breathtaking sceneries that my parents had told to me as I was growing up, what I saw in Rwanda even today still haunts my memory. Instead of the beautiful mountains and rivers and valleys, what I saw instead were the thousands of bodies of my fellow Rwandans who had been killed in a genocide. But to me, this represented a collective failure of world leaders and the international community to empathize with the Rwandans. The failure of the world to see in the other 
the simple truth that we are all bound together in this as a human race, and that in an increasingly globalized world, one cannot ignore problems happening in the community, and even in a country neighboring that neighbors yours. And if there's anything that the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean has taught us today, it is that it is even a mistake to ignore problems that happen across the ocean. Thankfully, however, unlike the Rwanda of 1994 that was in isolation, the current Rwanda has made it its duty to know and to let the world know that Rwanda is open for business. And Rwanda is shaping up to become a regional and international leader in the promotion of good governance, the fight against corruption, and the use of homegrown initiatives that respond directly to the needs of the Rwandan people. And I believe that Rwanda will soon begin to export these homegrown initiatives to other regional and international settings where the world, as we all know, is experiencing so much suffering. Thankfully, however, unlike the Rwanda of 1994, where a portion of the Rwandan people was barred from living and prospering in their own country, the current Rwanda is an example of what happens when leaders decide to build on a common identity and promote the well-being of all people. And as a result of the reform that were put in, in place in Rwanda, Rwanda has quickly become a tourist and investment destination thanks to these reforms. And so when I started grad school, I asked myself what I would do to contribute to a sustainable Rwanda. Because I believe that although Rwanda had come a long way from its most difficult days when the world looked the other way as the innocent Rwandans were calling for help, I was convinced that in Rwanda, just as it is the case here in the US and anywhere else in the world, that to build a brighter future, you cannot ignore the promise of education given to children. And as Rwanda has just adopted English as one of its official languages, I launched the Kigali Reading Center to provide and pave the pathway for children to be able to succeed in their lives. At the Kigali Reading Center, all we do is work hard to make sure that these kids know that somebody cares. We use three simple but very powerful tools to transform the lives of these kids one book at a time. And the three programs that we provide are, we have a lending library that is open to all children in the community. And we use story, uh, story time telling sessions. And this is one of our most popular programs that we have. In addition to this, uh, we also provide one-to-one -one tutoring services to children who come to us every time asking questions on how they can get ahead and improve their English skills. As I finish here today, I want to invite you all to join us, take a look at our website, tell your friends about what we do, and when you get a chance to come to Rwanda, please stop by the Kigali Reading Center, spend 30 minutes with a child, maybe an hour, reading to them. The smile that you see in the faces of these beautiful children will tell you that your investment is not in vain. And please come to Rwanda and see what the country has to offer. Because I assure you that where there used to be despair, hate, and fear, there is today hope, love, and peace, and security. And most importantly, there is a people that is resilient and that is capable and ready to do everything possible to give the Rwandan people the dignity that they deserve. Thank you all so much for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Thank you. Good. Great. Very nice. I have a, I have a, I have a couple of questions. So um, you, you talked to us about your, your journey. How, when, when you look out um, at a cam campus like UMass Boston um, and you compare from where you came from, what is your advice to uh, American or even non-American students who are here and have this wonderful opportunity? Um, how, how do you phrase it to them to take advantage of the opportunity that they have, knowing what you know and how difficult it can be in other parts of the world? It's a very good question. I think uh, what I would tell young people and anyone else in the audience is that uh, often we try to figure out somebody else to do work for us. And I think the very first place to begin is to figure out how you can be a solution to problems that are around you. And that's what I tell everybody I meet usually. Are you part of the solution? Mm -hmm. Or are you just complaining about the injustices that are happening in your community? Because often we can find resources within ourselves. 
And when you start to do something that is good, the community usually gets behind you. So I think everyone is capable of doing something good. So we can begin with ourselves, and then uh, the rest can just follow. Um, in this journey that you've taken, what's been your uh, biggest challenge? Uh, my biggest challenge has always been to uh, rally people around good causes. And uh, I think often uh, people, uh, I, I would say that th that's probably the, the, the first thing that I would say. So finding people who you can rally with together. Uh, and there are so many things happening you know, around the world that uh, people sometimes despair. Mm -hmm. You know, you tell people and they feel like the challenges are just so enormous that they cannot begin to, to work on them. And uh, what I tell people most of the time is that as long as you take the first step, usually, you, you know, you find people who are willing, who are actually waiting to see somebody else who might be able to uh, take the initiative. And what's been your biggest satisfaction? Uh, the community. I think uh, to just see people, you know, who, who get behind us as we do this work, um, it makes us feel like uh, anything that we put our minds to We'll be able to um, to accomplish. You know, you know, when you have the community behind you, I think that's uh, all that matters. Very right, good. And last one: Is there anything that people in this room can do to help you in your mission? Yes. Uh, so we collect books and ship them to Rwanda. But beyond this, uh, we we need to raise money. Basically, uh, we've been doing this mostly through the money that we own put in, mm. uh, small budget. But all this is done uh, to take books to Rwanda to support a small uh, NGO that we have, and it, it is expanding. We have children who travel three, uh, three hours, you know, walking to be able to come to where we are just mm -hmm. to pick up a book. Uh, it would be much better for us if we could uh, even get the services much closer to where they are. So, you know, join us, donate to our work. You know, you can do it through uh, the online uh, portal. You can come to us as we're sitting down the, uh, the table and speak to us. You know, whatever you can do uh, to, to move this work forward uh, would be much And you'll be right here, right? I'm going right to be right down the, the street. All right, thank you. Wonderful, thank you All so right. much. Thank you.